Thank you, and thank you all for coming. It is great to be here today. So often people ask me, why poetry? And I think when I hear that question, it means different things depending on who's asking it. Sometimes it's why poetry when I think your work is, what you have to talk about is so much more suited to journalism. Sometimes I think it means why poetry when no one really reads poetry anymore, which I know not, that that's not true. In this new retrospective monument, I've tried to trace the origins and the development of my work as a poet. In his memorial to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Auden wrote, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Likewise, my native land, my South, my Mississippi with its brutal history of racial violence and oppression inflicted my first wound. My deeper wound came later. When I was 19, I lost my mother. And in the weeks following her death, I tried to write my first poem as an adult dealing with that feeling of insurmountable grief. As in Liesel Mueller's words from her beautiful poem, When I Am Asked, which is also a poem about why she started writing poetry. I put my grief in the mouth of language, the only thing that would grieve with me. Imperatives for carrying on in the aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend, after hearing the story, says, my mother would never put up with that. Fight the urge to rattle off statistics that, more often, a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered. The hundredth time your father says, but she hated violence, why would she marry a guy like that? Don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait, are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man, and let go your rage when you recall those words were advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial before she was dead, when the charge was only attempted murder. Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later, or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue. They should work it out themselves. Just breathe when, after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men. Learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy with the words you cannot say. Let silence rain down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else, unburden yourself of the death of your mother, and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket and seed bed, and contend with what it means, the folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. When I was born, miscegenation was illegal in Mississippi and as many as 20 other states in the nation. And we like to think of that as a history from a whole other lifetime, and yet the symbolism of it, the underlying ideology lingers, and we see it even more now. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry 
returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year, you're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Southern Gothic. I have lain down into 1970, into the bed my parents will share for only a few more years. Early evening, they have not yet turned from each other in sleep, their bodies curved, parentheses framing the separate lives they'll wake to. Dreaming, I am again the child with too many questions, the endless why and why and why. My mother cannot answer, her mouth closed, a gesture toward her future, cold lips stitched shut. The lines in my young father's face deepen toward an expression of grief. I have come home from the schoolyard with the words that shadow us in this small southern town. Peckerwood and nigger lover, half-breed and zebra, words that take shape outside us. We're huddled on the tiny island of bed, quiet in the language of blood, the house unsteady on its cinder block haunches, sinking deeper into the muck of ancestry. Oil lamps flicker around us, our shadows, dark glyphs on the wall, bigger and stranger than we are. We hear so much these days about voter fraud when we should be talking about voter suppression, about gerrymandering, about intimidation, about ID laws, about purging the rolls. Of course, this is nothing new either. Back in the 60s, my grandmother lived across the street from the Mount Olive Baptist Church. And at that time, my mother and father and I were living with her, this interracial family. The church was doing a voter registration drive to get disenfranchised African Americans registered to vote. They didn't have a driveway either, and so my grandmother let them park the church bus in her driveway. It's for that reason that we were never sure if this act of terrorism was about us or the church doing its work. Incident. We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shades drawn, at the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross, trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered, white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our rooms and lit hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had all dimmed. 
When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. My mother dreams another country. Certainly not the one we find ourselves in now, but she certainly dreamt another country. Already the words are changing. She is changing from color to Negro, black still years ahead. This is 1966. She is married to a white man, and there are more names for what grows inside her. It is enough to worry about words like mongrel and the infertility of mules and mulattoes while flipping through a book of baby names. She has come home to wait out the long months, her room unchanged since she's been gone, dolls winking down from every shelf, all of them white. Every day she is flanked by the rituals of superstition, and there is a name she will learn for this too, maternal impression, the shape like an unknown country marking the back of the newborn's thigh. For now, women tell her to clear her head, to steady her hands, or she'll gray a lock of the child's hair wherever she worries her own, imprint somewhere the outline of a thing she craves too much. They tell her to stanch her cravings by eating dirt. All spring she is sat on her hands, her fingers numb. For a while each day she can't feel anything she touches, the arbor out back, the landscape's green tangle, the mole hill of her own swelling. Here, outside the city limits, cars speed by, clouds of red dust in their wake. She breathes it in, Mississippi, then drifts towards sleep, thinking of some place she's never been. Late, Mississippi is a dark backdrop bearing down on the windows of her room. On the TV in the corner, the station signs off, broadcasting its nightly salutation, the waving stars and stripes, our national anthem. E.O. Wilson was here not too long ago. And there's an epigraph um, in my next poem from E.O. Wilson. I grew up uh, in Mississippi and Georgia in the Deep South um, with a profound sense of psychological exile. This is what E.O. Wilson wrote. Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. That sense of psychological exile for me had everything to do with the fact that everywhere around the landscape of the South, there are monuments to the Confederacy, to Klansmen, to staunch segregationists. And of the hundreds of monuments about the Civil War, North and South, only a few, as historian Eric Foner points out, mention anything about black participation in the Civil War. And so it's easy to grow up in a place with a sense of psychological exile when none of the monuments tell the story about you or tell the full story about our shared American history. South. I return to a stand of pines, bone-thin phalanx flanking the roadside, tangle of understory, a dialectic of dark and light, and magnolias blossoming like afterthought, each flower a surrender, white flags draped among the branches. I returned to land's end, the swath of coast clear-cut and buried in sand, mangrove, live oak, gulf weed raised and replaced by thin palms, palmettos, symbols of victory or defiance over and over, marking this vanquished land. I returned to a field of cotton, hallowed ground as slave legend goes, each bowl holding the ghosts of generations, those who measured their days by the heft of sacks and lengths of rows, who sweat, flecked the cotton plants still sewn into our clothes. 
I returned to a country battlefield where colored troops fought and died, Port Hudson where their bodies swelled and blackened beneath the sun, unburied until Earth's green sheet pulled over them, unmarked by any headstones where the roads, buildings, and monuments are named to honor the Confederacy, where that old flag still hangs, I return to Mississippi, state that made a crime of me, mulatto, half-breed, native in my native land, this place, they'll bury me. My mother has been gone for 33 years now. And very rarely do I have dreams about her, which is um, a sad thing for me. Um, but the kinds that I do have, there are two kinds of dreams, and perhaps if you've lost someone, you have dreams like this too. And one kind of dream, I know that she's dead. And so the dream feels like a lovely visitation. And I wake happy because I've gotten to see her. In the other kind of dream, I don't know that anything has happened or that she's dead. And so there's always a moment of waking up and turning over and opening my eyes and realizing again what has happened, which I think is not unlike what Orpheus must have felt when he was not able to resist turning around to see if Eurydice was following him out of the underworld, thus banishing her there forever. Myth. I was asleep while you were dying. It's as if you slipped through some rift, a hollow I make between my slumber and my waking, the Erebus I keep you in, still trying not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow, but in dreams you live, so I try taking you back into morning. Sleep heavy, turning, my eyes open, I find you do not follow, again and again, this constant forsaking. Again and again, this constant forsaking, my eyes open, I find you do not follow, you back into morning, sleep heavy, turning. But in dreams you live, so I try taking not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow, the Erebus I keep you in, still trying. I make between my slumber and my waking. It's as if you slip through some rift, a hollow. I was asleep while you were dying. This book is called Monument, and certainly I have throughout my career tried to address what I was talking about to push back with against the sometimes official narrative that is inscribed on the landscape in our monuments and to re-inscribe those that have been erased or forgotten because of our shared amnesia. But it's a book also about memory for my mother, trying to, in language, create a lyrical monument to her memory. Monument. Today the ants are busy beside my front steps, weaving in and out of the hill they're building. I watch them emerge and like everything I've forgotten, disappear into the subterranean, a world made by displacement. In the cemetery last June, I circled lost weeds and grass grown up all around, the landscape blurred and waving. At my mother's grave, ants streamed in and out like arteries, a tiny hill rising above her untended plot. Bit by bit, red dirt piled up, spread like a rash on the grass. I watched a long time the ants' determined work, how they brought up soil of which she will be part 
and piled it before me. Believe me when I say I've tried not to begrudge them their industry, this reminder of what I haven't done. Even now, the mound is a blister on my heart, a red and humming swarm. My last book, um, Thrall, was dedicated to my father. My father, the poet Eric Trethaway, who was one of my first teachers, not only just as a parent, but I literally took his graduate poetry workshop when I was in graduate school. And you know, because of that, my father and I um, had a, a, a long poetry relationship. And once I started publishing poems, we would often stand at podiums like this and read back and forth because, of course, our poems uh, spoke to each other. They both um, spoke about my mother, my father's first wife, um, our shared grief um, over her death, my childhood. But there was something strange um, about those readings, uh, and not simply that we were a father and daughter team that my stepmother used to call a dog and pony show. No, what it was was that there was a moment in one of my father's very lovely poems, a poem called Her Swing, in which he used a piece of language that it took me 40 years to figure out why it made me so uncomfortable. Now, the reason that I had to write that book, Thrall, and dedicate it to my father was that I needed to have a very personal conversation with him, um, but in the only language he really listened to, which is the language of poetry. And the conversation was about the deeply ingrained and often unexamined notions of racial difference and racial hierarchy, these things that were first codified during the Enlightenment for all the wonderful things that the Enlightenment gave us, that's when philosophers also began to codify ideas of racial difference and hierarchy. It's in the air we breathe and the water that we drink even now, such that my beloved father could still harbor some ideas about racial difference and hierarchy. This is after a chalk drawing by J. H. Hasselhorst, 1864. Knowledge. Whoever she was, she comes to us like this. Lips parted, long hair spilling from the table like water from a pitcher. Nipples drawn out for inspection. Perhaps to foreshadow the object she'll become, a skeleton on a pedestal, a row of skulls on a shelf. To make a study of the ideal female body, four men gather around her. She is young and beautiful and drowned, a Venus de Medici risen from the sea, sleeping. As if we could mistake this work for sacrilege, the artist entombs her body in a pyramid of light, a temple of science over which the anatomist presides. In the service of beauty, to know it, he lifts a flap of skin beneath her breast as one might draw back a sheet. We will not see his step-by-step -step parsing, a translation. Mary or Catherine or Elizabeth to Corpus, Ariella, Vulva. In his hands, instruments of the empirical, scalpel, pincers, cold as the room must be cold, all the men in coats, trimmed in velvet or fur, soft as the down of her pubis. Now one man is smoking, another tilts his head to get a better look. Yet another at the head of the table peers down as if enthralled, his fist on a stack of books. In the drawing, this is only the first cut, a delicate wounding. And yet how easily the anatomist blade opens a place in me like a curtain drawn upon a room in which each learned man is my father, 
and I hear again his words. I study my crossbreed child. Misnomer and taxonomy, the language of zoology. Here he is all of them, the preoccupied man, an artist, collector of experience, the skeptic angling his head, his thoughts tilting toward what I cannot know, the marshaller of knowledge, knuckling down a stack of books, even the dissector, his scalpel in hand like a pen, poised above me, aimed straight for my heart. It was perhaps Thomas Jefferson in Notes on the State of Virginia who first called for a kind of comparative anatomy. Jefferson believed that if you were to cut the Negro open, you would be able to ascertain what he believed to be the root of black inferiority. There were physicians in the 19th century who did this work. This is Dr. Samuel Adolphus Cartwright on Dissecting the White Negro, 1851. To strip from the flesh the specious skin, to weigh in the brain pan seeds of white pepper, to find in the body its own diminishment, blood deep and definite, to measure the heft of lack, to make of the work of faith the work of science, evidence the word of God, Canaan be the servant of servants, thus to know the truth of this, this derelict corpus, a dark compendium, this atavistic assemblage, flatter feet, bowed legs, a shorter neck, so deep the tincture. See it? We still know white from not. My father first took me to Monticello, Jefferson's home, about 30 years ago, and I knew that I needed to go back there. I needed to take him back there in order to finish this book. Whereas it was once taboo to bring up Sally Hemings when you took the tour, now it's the f official position of the Jefferson Foundation that Thomas Jefferson fathered several of Sally Hemings' children, and so now the docent will mention this before you take the tour. Now that it's no longer taboo, the kinds of conversations you might hear have changed, but I think the ideology underlying them have not. Enlightenment. In the portrait of Jefferson that hangs at Monticello, he is rendered two-toned, his forehead white with illumination, a lit bulb, the rest of his face in shadow, darkened as if the artist meant to contrast his bright knowledge, its dark subtext. By 1805, when Jefferson sat for the portrait, he was already linked to an affair with his slave. Against a backdrop blue and ethereal, a wash of paint that seems to hold him in relief, Jefferson gazes out across the centuries, his lips fixed as if he's just uttered some final word. The first time I saw the painting, I listened as my father explained the contradictions, how Jefferson hated slavery, though, out of necessity, my father said, had to own slaves, that his moral philosophy meant he could not have fathered those children, would have been impossible, my father said. For years, we debated the distance between word and deed. I'd follow my father from book to book, gathering citations, listen as he named, like a field guide to Virginia, each flower and tree and bird, as if to prove a man's pursuit of knowledge is greater than his shortcomings, the limits of his vision. I did not know then the subtext of our story, that my father could imagine Jefferson's words made flesh in my flesh, the improvement of the blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites, or that my father could believe he'd made me better. 
When I think of this now, I see how the past holds us captive, its beautiful ruin etched on the mind's eye. My young father, a rough outline of the old man he's become, needing to show me the better measure of his heart, an equation writ large at Monticello. That was years ago. Now we take in how much has changed, talk of Sally Hemings, someone asking how white was she, parsing the fractions as if to name what made her worthy of Jefferson's attentions, a near white quadroon mistress, not a plain black slave. Imagine stepping back into the past, our guide tells us then, and I can't resist whispering to my father, this is where we split up. I'll head around to the back. When he laughs, I know he's grateful I've made a joke of it. This history that links us, white father, black daughter, even as it renders us other to each other. Elegy for my father. I think by now the river must be thick with salmon. Late August, I imagine it as it was that morning, drizzle needling the surface, mist at the banks like a net settling around us, everything damp and shining. That morning, awkward and heavy in our hip waders, we stalked into the current and found our places, you upstream a few yards and out far deeper. You must remember how the river seeped in over your boots and you grew heavier with that defeat. All day I kept turning to watch you, how first you mimed our guide's casting, then cast your invisible line, slicing the sky between us. And later, rod in hand, how you tried again and again to find that perfect arc flight of an insect skimming the river's surface. Perhaps you recall I cast my line and reeled in two small trout we could not keep. Because I had to release them, I confess I thought about the past, working the hooks loose, the fish writhing in my hands, each one slipping away before I could let go. I can tell you now that I tried to take it all in, record it for an elegy I'd write one day when the time came. Your daughter, I was that ruthless. What does it matter if I tell you I learned to be? You kept casting your line, and when it did not come back empty, it was tangled with mine. Some nights, Dreaming, I step again into the small boat that carried us out and watch the bank receding, my back to where I know we are headed. When I started writing that book, I was a little angry at my father because I felt like he was participating in this ongoing erasure of my mother. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I mean, I just read Enlightenment a few minutes ago. My whole life, if I did anything well, people would say to me, oh, well, that's your white side. As if nothing good had been passed down to me from my mother from that side of my family. Even though what I'm trying to say to you today is that I'm a poet, not because I'm the daughter of a poet, but because I'm a daughter of a woman who I miss very much. Anyway, I was telling my father this. I, I was telling him that I was upset with him and, and he very wisely, because my father was, said to me, quoting Yeats, 
We make of the quarrel with others rhetoric, but of the quarrel with ourselves, poetry. And I was mad, because I was like, oh no. Now I've got to make this a quarrel with myself. And I felt like I knew how to do that, because that's what I had done in my book, Native Guard. I had an argument with my nation about historical amnesia and forgetting the way our monuments help us to forget. But ultimately, that book was about me not properly, I think, memorializing my own mother. So I'd done this before, and I thought, OK, I can do it. And so that last poem I read, Articulation, in which I call myself, um, I'm sorry, um, the poem Elegy, in which I call myself Ruthless, was me trying to get at that. That book began with two epigraphs, one from uh, T.S. Eliot and one from Robert Penn Warren. The first is Robert Penn Warren, what is love? One name for it is knowledge. After such knowledge, what forgiveness? When I began writing the book, I thought that I was writing it to forgive my father. By the end of it, the forgiveness that I needed was my own. But there's always poems that don't make it into a book. This poem I'm going to read now is one that didn't make it into the book because I think I wasn't fully able to make that quarrel with myself. And it took me years after his death, he died in 14, before I could pull this poem out and see what was wrong with it. When you hear it, I'm just going to tell you that when I pulled it out, it was just as you're going to hear, except for two words, the last two words, the last line of the poem. It's about um, a painting by Vermeer, his painting, A Maid Asleep. Repentance. To make it right, Vermeer painted, then painted over this scene. A woman alone at a table, the cloth pushed back, rough folds at the edge, as if someone had risen in haste, abandoning the chair beside her. A wine glass nearly empty, just in her reach. Though she's been called idle and drunken, a woman drowsing, you might see in her gesture melancholia. Eyelids drawn, she rests her head in her hand. Beyond her, a still life, white jug, bowl of fruit, a goblet overturned. Before this, a man stood in the doorway, a dog lay on the floor perhaps to exchange loyalty for betrayal. Vermeer erased the dog and made of the man a mirror, framed by the open door. Pentimento, the word for a painter's change of heart. Revision on canvas means the same as remorse after sin. Were she to rise a mirror behind her, the woman might see herself as I did, turning to rise from my table, then back as if into Vermeer's scene. It was after the quarrel, after you'd had again too much to drink, after the bottle did not shatter, though I'd brought it down hard on the table, and the dog had crept from the room to hide. Later, I found a trace of what I'd done, bruise on the table the size of my thumb. Worrying it, I must have looked as she does, eyes downcast, my head on the heel of my palm. In paint, a story can change, mistakes be undone. Imagine still life with father and daughter, a moment so far back there's still time to take the glass from your hand or mine. Two more poems. Reach after my father. Right off I hear him singing, 
the strings of his old guitar hymning the darkness as before. Late nights on the front porch, the mountains across the valley blurred to outline. We are at it again, father and daughter deep in our cups, rehearsing the long years between us. In the distance, I hear the foghorn call of bullfrogs, envoys from the river of lamentation my father is determined to cross. Already, I know where this is headed. How many times has the night turned toward regret? My father saying, if only I'd been a better husband, she'd be alive today, saying Gwen and I would get back together if she were alive. It's the same old song. He is Orpheus trying to bring her back with the music of his words, lines of a poem drifting now into my dream. Picking the first chords, my father leans into the neck of the guitar, rolls his shoulders until he's lost in it, the song carrying him across the porch and down into the damp grass. Even asleep, I know where he is going. I cannot call him back. Through the valley, the black top winds like a river, and he is stepping into it, walking now toward the other side where she waits, my mother, just out of reach. And this last poem is after Miguel Cabrera's portrait of St. Gertrude, 1763. Articulation. In the legend, St. Gertrude is called to write after seeing in a vision the sacred heart of Christ. Cabrera paints her among the instruments of her faith, quill, inkwell, an open book, rings on her fingers like Christ's many wounds, the heart emblazoned on her chest, the holy infant nestled there as if sunk deep in a wound. Against the dark backdrop, her face is a wafer of light. How not to see in the saint's image my mother's last portrait, the dark backdrop, her dress black as a habit, the bright edge of her afro wringing her face with light. And how not to recall her many wounds, ring finger shattered, her ex-husband's bullet finding her temple, lodging where her last thought lodged. Three weeks gone, my mother came to me in a dream, her body whole again, but for one perfect wound, the singular articulation of all of them, a whole center of her forehead, the size of a wafer, light pouring from it. How then could I not answer her life with mine, she who saved me, with hers, and how could I not, bathed in the light of her wound, find my calling there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a brief question and answer session. If you raise your hands, we'll bring microphones to you. Thank you so much, Professor Trathaway. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Um, you talked about putting grief in the mouth of language. Mm -hmm. I wonder for you, how did you cope with the sorrow and the grieving of your mother? Sorry. Hmm. Thank you for uh, quoting those lines. They bear repeating. Um, I understand that Liesl Mueller lives in Chicago. Uh, so if you guys don't know this poem, when I am asked, please go look it up. 
At the end, she writes, I put my grief in the mouth of language, the only thing that would grieve with me. And in those words, she articulates, I think, something that is perhaps common to all of us. Um, that is the idea that there are things that are so painful or so traumatic that they are unspeakable. And yet, poetry allows us to get at the unspeakable. After 9-11, there were more poems read and written in the United States than had been in a long time because that's where people turn to, to put their grief. We put our joy there, too. How many times has someone written a poem for, for vows, for a wedding, or for the birth of a child, or just to woo the beloved? Um, it does both of those things for us. It took me a long time to be able to find the language that was not simply for me, a cell for me, but something that the reader could inhabit as well. I wrote many, many, many bad poems over the years in my journal because I just needed to, to say something about it. But in that process, the thing that I found, which goes back to what Liesel Mueller said, is that the kind of control that one has in a poem with the formal elegance of language, the shaping of this made thing, transforms the grief. It makes it something beautiful. In Percy Bysshe Shelley's words, poetry is the mirror that makes beautiful that which is distorted. He also told us that poems are records of the best and happiest times in the happiest and best minds. So even writing about those depths of grief and despair, the making of that poem in language was the happiest thing. That was the joy. I think that's the way I could cope. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, was there one more? <laughs> okay. We have a question down in the middle. Okay. Thank you. thank you for your reading. I know that you are both a poet and a professor. <clears throat> if you were trying to get uh, young people interested in poetry. I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm going <laughs> to. What would be a, a top ten list or, you know, four or five poets that are, I think about Elizabeth Bishop or something like that, mm -hmm. who are accessible, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And immediate enough that people go, oh, I, I see what you're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, that is a tough question. And I don't know if, um, I mean, I have my favorite poets that that I would read to somebody because I'm excited about them and I feel like my enthusiasm you know, might be catching and they would be excited too. But in the classroom and working with my students, I try very hard to figure out something about them, something about the poems that they might be moved by or need to hear at a particular time. Because I think that's also the case for all of us. There are certain poems that move us at different times in our lives, uh, poems that maybe you didn't quite appreciate the first time, but then later on you read it, something's changed, you've changed, it matters differently to you. So generally, I try to find those poems that might speak to the particular student, because my, my firm belief is that there is a poem out there for everyone, that it just takes finding the right one, and any of us can get hooked on poetry. Um, but I will say, you know, for accessibility, I do think that's important. You know, um, I didn't like reading poems if I felt like I couldn't understand them. And I, and I think it's weird when people say uh, they don't understand the poem, but they, but they call it deep. And I'm like, well, how do you know if it's deep if you actually don't understand it? So, you know, I try to go for poems that, you know, mean something to me. And I, I know that I, I feel like a lot of people, um, students, respond well to um, Yusuf Komanyaka's facing it about the Vietnam uh, Memorial in Washington. That gets people a lot. Um, I have had some of the most lively discussions about poetic language and meter and rhythm um, with Theodore Rutke's My Papa's Waltz. Um, you asked me for a top 10. I, I may stop it too, because um, now it's, it's getting harder. Like if I had to really curate just those ones, but um, yeah, I think so. 
Yeah. Well, then another one is, you know, uh, Billy Collins' um, Poetry 101, where he, he actually addresses sort of how we've, we've learned to not like poetry sometimes in school. Um, because he's trying to get the students in, the, in just to enjoy the poem. He's talking about you know, wanting them to sort of surf across the surface of it, but all they want to do is tie it to a chair and beat a confession out of it. So you know, I think that that, to, yeah. <laughs> so to sort of laugh about that and to, to be reminded that we can just enjoy uh, a poem before we have to you know, plumb its depths for something else. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your coming today. Thank How you. do your students um, view rap music and that kind of that genre? Do they see it as poetry? You know, I I, I don't know that we've talked about it a lot. Um, I'm actually dealing more with my students these days, um, being into like social media Instagram poets like Ruby Core, I guess. Um, that they talk to me more about that than um, hip hop lyrics or, or something. Um, I occasionally still have students who are interested in, in writing songs, song lyrics, so they come to a poetry class, you know, with this idea that, you know, learning to write uh, poetry will help them with their song lyrics. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if that means that something is, is Changing, yeah. And until you asked that question, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Thank you so much. Um, when you think of authors or poets who have been influential in your life, are there any that stand out for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ones that, in my mind, stand out first, that first comes to mind, are a, a few Irish poets. Um, Yeats, Seamus Heaney, the Nobel laureate, and Ivan Boland, a woman poet. Because when I was trying to write Native Guard about my South and my Mississippi, it was those poets that I could look at and find in them also that same sense of psychological exile, that same connectedness to place and to history. Um, I read Seamus Heaney's North uh, again and again, and it showed me how to write about my South. So those are the ones that I think of first. Thank you very much.